I had to go in emergency yesterday. Um, I was kind of ignoring this shit going on in my head and I took a look in the mirror and put the flashlight in and I'm like, well, I got an infection in my head. That's not good. So I went and then uh, first one I had to get my driver's license renewed because it expired. And then they told me my BC medical card had expired in 2019. They canceled it due to no contact. <laughs> Shows you how often I go to the doctor, right? It's funny, I just realized when I walked into that hospital late yesterday, the last time I walked into a hospital was in Southeast Asia when they kept me, when I thought I just had the flu and they kept me and told me I was gonna be dead in two days, three days then when I first walked in and then it was in there 24 hours and they said, you'd probably be dead in two days. So I'm not big on hospitals, right? Anyway, Cost me three hundred thirty-seven dollars. I guess I'll get it back when I got the, the BC medical thing, the application to read when it goes through in twenty-one days. Whatever, sir. Did it. So the guy comes in, looks at my mouth, and he's like, "Got a flashlight." He goes, "Oh, I can see it. Something stuck in your head back there." I'm like, "What?" And he said it was superficial. It's like a, a fish bone or something's wedged back there, like back here. And he goes, well, I can either, uh, your body, so it's the, what's it called? My brain's farting, having enough coffee. Anyways, it's irritated. It's irritating and swelling and irritating all the muscle in the joint of my jaw and my ear. And it's causing problems. I can feel it up my cheek and behind my eye a little bit. And he said, uh, superficial, says your body's going to push it out. He says, or I can try to cut it and cut it out. I'll try to cut it out right now. I'm kind of like, <laughs> I'm good. I'll see you later. It'll make its way out. I'm fine. <laughs> Whatever. So, it's not cancer, not a tumor. It's not related to my earlier broken, torn half jaw. Here's back. It's just discomfort. And I'll get over it. I'll live. 
And that's enough about me. Uh, okay. I want to hear some frickin' voices. Hopefully somebody's going to get help today or they're going to help us. Let's get right into it. This is titled, My Boy Scout Encounter and Finally Being Free of This Burden. There's the title, flavor that I like to read. Mark, this is red. Well, Steve, thanks for all you have done and are doing to provide a safe and cathartic place for the club and our return members to share these unasked for experiences. I've attempted to keep this concise and full of proper punctuation. Appreciate it. My encounter slash event was many years ago, happened around 78, so I would have been 12 or 13 at the time, and I'm 56 now. My name is at the end of this, and yes, please use it. I can give more background later if you want, but just kind of want to get this out. I was on a 50-miler Boy Scout trip in the Hetch Hetchy Wilderness, northwest of Yosemite. My second one of these scout trips, the other being in Desolation Wilderness the prior year. In a nutshell, we'd stopped the 50-mile event on day three of a six-day hike around La Conte Point and Rancheria. People were coming down from the high country so mosquito-bitten that they looked like lepers. They talked to the scout masters and suggested that it was pretty out of control and that we should rethink our route. So we, the scout leaders, decided to go off trail and we found a very cool camp area, not designated, that allows us to do daily hikes down to where the Tulum, Tulum River poured into Hetch Hetchy. Kind of sketchy in places to get down there. And when I think back, now that I have kids, it was wild how free we were and unsupervised. But it was a long time ago. But the fishing was so good and the area we found to set up our tents was pretty special. And we hiked all over every day. That the leaders, two to three, decided to just spend a trip here for a few days then hike back to the way we came instead of the loop that was planned. Okay, on to the event. On the fourth or fifth afternoon, not exactly sure, after I'd caught three or four fat rainbow trout, as had some of the other scouts, I left them cleaned on a stringer in the ice cold river water that entered the reservoir. We decided we'd bring them back up to our spot, 150, 200 yards, maybe more, up through fairly wild timber and boulders, steep, and have them for lunch the next day. We already had lots of trout to eat for dinner from that morning. Anyway, that night we did a snipe hunt with the Greenhorn Scouts and made a racket and had a blast. We ate and crashed out as only young teen boys can do after another day of ridiculous activity, so spent. So to give you the layout, of our cool camping area, we had found an area way off trail, halfway between the trail and the headwaters of Hetch Hetchy. Found because we were looking for a way to get down to where the Tulum River entered the reservoir, as I mentioned earlier, that was fairly flat but broken up by giant car-sized and bigger boulders, as well as giant timber. So our group of eight to 10 scouts could pick a spot to set up their tube tent. Steve, do you know slash remember what those are? Basically a tube of plastic and one would fix a rope between two trees, etc. through the tent and put a big rock or a stake in each corner to make a tent. Classic. Both ends open at all times. So I had set mine up about 40 feet from the main campfire in a nice flat area between two large pine trees and was sacked out. We were all pretty spread out. Each scout claiming his spot was the best. I have no idea what time it was other than late but I was woken up by the sounds of walking, crunching, etc. The fire was about 90% out, so just a flicker coming through the side of my tube tent. But there was a mostly full moon as well. I just assumed it was a scoutmaster slash leader as it was slow walking, bipedal, and heavy sounding. So, not some 12 year old kid that had to pee, haha. <laughs> Plodding, slow, heavy sounding, weird. Okay, so, I'm so tired that I sit up and lean out the foot side opening of my tent and look to my left and about 20 feet away, maybe more, maybe less, at another scout's tent, there's a massive creature slash thing right at the end of the tent on all fours with his head in the tent. Oh my God. Kind of moving a bit, adjusting his position. I saw a giant effing thing 
So I was thinking bull or a cow, not even thinking bear. For sure not thinking Sasquatch at all, but I did know a bit about that through TV, etc. I was trying to take it in, figure it out. Oddly not scared, but curious. I was thinking of yelling to warn the scout who was snoring lightly in that tent, but thought that he might, but that might be a mistake and ramp up the situation to have the bull or cow freak out. Excuse me. I was so tired looking at this thing, then thinking, how is a bull on its elbows? Why is it rocking back and forth slightly? And it has no hooves, but looks like feet? I see pads or like a person's feet bottoms. The chest is so thick, it looks like a bull, but it has a waist. Hair was dark brown like a cow's, but two to four inches long and neat. Not like bulls slash cows I've seen, but really giant. Six feet or more thick at the chest? Six feet or more thick at the chest. I wonder if you meant wide. I guess not. But what the F is this? Just dwarfing that little tube tent. While well, all these thoughts are going through my sleepy mind, I look straight out where my feet were pointing, where one of the Scoutmaster's tent was, a firefighter from Oklahoma, California, true outdoorsman, fisherman, hunter, had an actual tent, haha, <laughs> a man I respected and admired, and I am so bummed I can't remember his name. I've asked my parents and they remembered him as well, but can't remember the name either. I can figure it out if I try hard enough. But he had his face out of the flap that was unzipped looking at this creature being, slash being, then looking at me and we locked eyes. I think I was smiling and he gave me the shh sign, putting his index finger to his lips and did a very subtle point that indicated get back in your tent, like gesturing ever so slightly to go back in. So I did. What is strange to me is I fell right back asleep. Crap, I lose sleep over that night at, I lose sleep over that night at times to this very day. So the next morning I wake up and immediately feel like talking about what I saw, want to run to my friends, etc. Well, the leader slash firefighter calls me right over, calls me over right off the other scouts. Slash kids are just starting to stir, and we go for a very short walk away from the campsite, and I ask, what was that? That was crazy, blah, blah. And he puts his hands on my shoulders, looks me in the eyes, and smiles, and says, good thing we did not scare that bear. I'm sure he saw my confused face, and immediately said, it was a bear. And let's not tell the other scouts, as it'll make them uncomfortable and might scare them. I said, okay, and that was that. That day, we went down to the lake and all of the trout on my stringer were gone and only the heads were left. Not tore up, not on the bank. And I was told by the same leader that the bears ate them, maybe. But very well behaved bears, so neat. The rest of the trip was uneventful, but very fun. I did not think about what I experienced for years and years until it just kept coming back into my memory. I finally told my parents, about it this year, 2020, both in their 80s. They asked why I had not mentioned it earlier. Shit, this is the only time I've ever put it down in words. I just recently wrote it down and used some of that time, timeline, sorry. Just recently wrote it down and used some of that to timeline this recounting. I've only mentioned it recently in passing to my wife and daughters as well as a couple family friends to be a, to the expected ridicule. I did step up and shut them down as we have a great family relationship and they understood that I am serious. This is all I need. I know what I saw and that will not change. Good for you. I'm right there with you. I often have the thought that the scout master slash firefighter might have known what that was that we saw and I have to think that yes he must have or why would you let a bear poke its head into a tent at 11 or 12 on a of an 11 or 12 year old boy, a massive 800 pound bear with feet and elbows for shit's sakes, and just indicate, yeah, let's go back to bed. He would have freaked out and been screaming, etc. right? He could have had a kid or kids killed on his and the other leader's watch. Yeah, no doubt, man. You see a, a bear of any flavor over top of a kid, you don't just sit there and watch to see what's gonna happen. <laughs> no one, ever. You fight. 
One thing I found interesting when I finally talking to my parents for the first time about this encounter, I started to become emotional just as I lost the cell connection. And I guess I'm a bit grateful for that as I called them back. My mom said that when I got back from this particular 50 miler, that when I was dropped off, I sat on the steps in the garage that led to the house and cried and cried. And she sat there and cried right along with me. I don't remember that. Not at all. God bless you for providing this forum and truth and honesty is a crazy F. Sorry. God bless you for providing this forum of truth and honesty. It's a crazy up to up time on this planet. You make it a better place and give us all, me for sure, hope. Let's take it back for the people. Please use my name. Orlo C. Jones. Orlo, you're a superhero, man. Absolutely appreciate you coming forward, as do tens of thousands of other people without a doubt. And you bang the nail on the head at that point about the scout leader just watching a bear going in a tent? Nope. I think about that sometimes. You know, if I had to... I think about what... How stressed I would be today with everything that I know. Everything that I've seen and heard. Sounds like just somebody fired up a big cat or something over... A lot over. I guess we're gonna have to put up with that background sound. That's a loud motor. Please stop. <laughs> Anyways, I couldn't imagine the stress that I would have having a bunch of kids in the middle of nowhere for real with me. I wouldn't sleep a wink. I wouldn't be able to. Unless I had them all strategically. I mean, I always strategically lay down where I'm going to sleep. Whether it be to keep horses from running out of the valley at the nighttime and camping in a, in a pinch, pushing the horses ahead. That's a strategic way of making your camp or when you're uh, hunting on foot, camping on the low side of the main trail during nighttime because the, the cold thermal air is sink. But I don't know, I would be uh, very, very particular on where I would have everybody pitch their tent out, that's for sure. I mean, how would you cover everybody's ass by yourself or even two people at nighttime with all angles in the timber, right? You need some, you need some rock walls. But anyway, that noise is very distracting. If I close the shed, the shop door, then the echoes in here just magnify big time. It's a little frustrating. I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to get out of here and get up into the mountains. It's driving me bonkers. I'm, it's like it's being at you, it's like being in a long race, and you're finally at the end of that finish line, and there's the at the end of the, the race, and the finish line is just right there. You can't wait to get there. Oh, thank God it stopped. I can't wait to get out there in the middle of nowhere and start videotaping everything I see, more adventures, share it all with everybody. I still got to get more hunting knowledge videoed up and shared before I go on the other channel. Anyway, I'm babbling away. I only got a coffee and a half. Got to get some more of me, get some more voices heard. But anyway, Orlo, thank you so much for making that share, man. Getting that off your chest. And if you ever have anybody give you a little bit of uh, ridicule, Send them this video, send your family this video. They can hear of how many thousands and thousands of other people have had not the exact same detailed experience, but the same being in front of their faces, right? <clears throat> and and um, with no previous knowledge shared about them to any of us ever, right? Until now. This is titled The Club of No Return. Hello, Steve. I want to add to add my story. All right, hold on a minute. I got to slow down my eyeballs in my mouth. Hello, Steve. I want to add my story to your roundtable of discussion, and I hope it can help someone with their puzzle. All right. Thank you. I'm archery hunter in Washington State and love hunting elk in the springtime. Before the experiences I've had, I've been hunting this same area for five years continually. Since this experience, I've had multiple experiences that will write in more about. I'd like to make a shout out to my mom who believes my stories and listens to you. In September 2016, I was elk hunting with a friend in Washington State. Everything started great. We got up early and drove to a spot where we'd ride our mountain bikes down a few miles into an area and start looking for elk. This year, they actually had the area closed off. 
mostly due to fire danger, but we had headed into an area anyway. The log company had just opened up to a new opened up to a new logging road to an area we could access and it looked good for hunting. After riding in a few miles, we stopped on the road to check out a good looking area on foot down another logging road that was grown over slightly. So, we ditching our bikes and grabbed my bow, then we started walking slowly down the road. Just as we were walking down the road, I saw two flashes go across the road from the other side. Now to paint a picture, now to paint a picture, this is older growth trees sparsely apart with four foot tall ferns and downfall in between. After seeing the blur run across the road, I assumed it was another animal. It was an animal or an elk. As we were walking slowly and quietly down the road listening, I heard footsteps paralleling us. At this point in time, I still think elk. So I start sneaking into the ferns to look. I crawled slowly and sent out some cow-calf calls to see if I got any answers. After going in 20 or 30 feet and no response back, I stood up and looked around to find nothing. I thought, this is weird. I didn't know what it was. Then, so we continued on down the road on foot after getting out of the bush. After walking always down the road, we came to a bend in the road where I saw a very large excrement in the middle of the road. Now, this was next to some sticker patches where I can see it. Looks like black bears are all around, but it looked human and very large. Three to four times the size of a human excrement in the middle of the road. I thought that was weird considering it looked fresh and it was early with no one no one in sight around us. I blew it off to think maybe it's a very large black bear poop. Looking further down the road, I see a tree about four to six inches around, about seven feet up. Its top is snapped and pointing towards a large wide trail. Thinking nothing, but that's weird. I couldn't reach that and I'm still in elk hunting mode. Thinking nothing, but that's weird. I couldn't reach that and I'm still in elk hunting mode. So I started looking for elk sign what I find fresh elk scrapes. After chatting with my hunting partner, we proceeded to go down this four to five foot wide trail where the broken tree was pointing to go. We proceeded in about 30 feet or so in the thick brush, a foot or two next to me. Something stands up and it sounded pissed. Okay, hold on a minute. We proceeded in about 30 feet or so in the thick brush a foot or two next to me. One foot. <laughs> two feet. Something stands up and it sounded pissed. I jumped away after probably being in arm's length of this thing and knocked an arrow from my quiver thinking, holy crap, this thing's huge. Now this area is very dense. You can only see in a few feet my partner is between it and me. With this massive thing in the middle, in the middle, that my partner can't see because of the angle, and I can clearly see that it's an upright, massive person. Let's stress on the word person. It began thrashing the vegetation around, showing its aggravation about us being there. I thought to myself while at full draw, pointing at this thing, thinking I'll shoot it with my bow and arrow if it comes out to the trail, then drop my bow, pull my sidearm then dump a mag into it so hopefully my buddy can get away. Just as I'm thinking that, at full draw, it stops thrashing around and on two feet, it walks off into the bushes. <clears throat> Excuse me. After it walks off, completely pale-faced and in shock at what I saw, I told my partner that we needed to get the hell out of there. So we got our mountain bikes and started riding out. And about almost to my truck, my partner yells at me, do you hear that? I was like, hear what? All I can hear is wind in my face as we were flying down the straightaway with within five to six hundred yards from the truck. Then I heard it screaming. I could feel it vibrating in my chest, kind of awestruck, stood there thinking of walking in the woods to find this thing. It was like nothing I've ever heard. And it sounded like just a little ways into the brush, about 30 to 40 years, yards out. I thought it's definitely this beast following us out. Just then another hunter comes down the trail and we locked eyes to say, what the hell is that? Thinking back, I wish I would have told the, told the hunting to get the hell out of there. Oh, probably, you probably meant hunter. 
Thinking back, I wish I would have told the hunter to get the hell out of there. Maybe he listens to you, Steve, and I can fill in if anything more that may have happened. After that, it stopped screaming, and we headed the last few hundred yards out, then loaded up and got out of there. I hope that hunter's okay. I wouldn't have gone back in there. There are missing people in this area I hunt, but I don't know if the Sabe are responsible for those cases. I have more stories, Steve. Love what you're doing. Regards, Mike the Bowhunter. P.S. I hope grammar is correct. Word for me, Mike. You did a great job, man. Thanks for coming out and sharing that with everybody through me. Now listen, one thing you might have, you left out was a description of what you saw. You said you saw a large person. If you can, and you said you got more, throw it all down, man. Throw, put everything you got into an email, get it to me, and I'll get it out to everybody here, all right? I want to know the, what you've seen. Give us a description of what you saw. And then uh, and share with us everything else you got too, all right? And who knows, maybe that man is uh, following this channel, you never know. Or maybe he's missing. <laughs> you never know, right? You never know. The amount of people that are watching this channel is, is uh, it's pretty impressive how many people are watching. But anyway, welcome to the club. It's a huge club. Welcome to the club. Yeah, send more in, Mike, for sure. I want to hear a description of what you saw, man. And another elk hunter, right? <clears throat> it's like Dave told me a long time ago that uh, elk hunters are far more likely to have encounters with these people than not than other hunters, right? So and that's always in the back of my mind, especially right now, because that's what I'm doing. As soon as I leave here, I'm going after elk. And it's right in the... You know where I'm first going? The first place I'm going is near uh, McBride, British Columbia. You're going to hook up some friends there who have a private cabin, remote cabin there. We're going to go up you know, the mountains. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> where that significance of that is, is not too far from there is the BC Alberta border just on this side of Jasper. That's where the Jasper RCMP told a friend of mine there was tons and tons of sightings on the just on the BC side of the BC Alberta border, just inside of Jasper. And then uh, what else? We had the man who had the abusive father trout fishing with him. Dad was farther up the creek. He stood there and seen that thing running up the bank. And that is right in the same mountain range, just over the top of where I'm going first. Also, right where I'm going is where the other faller where that faller told our logger friend, our First Nations friend, who had the thing standing on his machine at nighttime, he was broken down, jumped off. And he was up near Mackenzie with these guys, and the guy told him about dumping that huge cedar tree, and there was a long, huge skeleton in that trunk of that tree. Human-like, but huge. And Fish and Game, RCMP, and the black vehicles, whatever showed up, all the logging got pulled out of there, and it's still gated today. Well, that is right where I'm going too. That happened there. What else? Well, a girlfriend of mine had that one uh, loping beside, she quote, loping beside her car, stooped over, looking in the window at her. And that wasn't, that was right there as well, right near there as well. So, um, yeah, I'd be lying if I said I didn't think about these things a lot right now and where I'm going, what I'm going to be doing. It's, and every single one of you who's who has had this reality slapped in your face, and you're a hunter or an angler, and you're going out anyway, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But anyway, and then after that, then I head even farther north up to my friends. I chase more elk, where uh, nonstop experiences are going on all along the Peace River, near where I'm going. Elk hunting and these beings. It's like when I was up north, you know, when farther up north, it's always as a as a rule, wherever there's elk, there's grizzly bears. Well, it seems wherever there's elk, there's these bush beings as well, right? Now, moving along. <clears throat> Interesting footprints, title this one. Public if you like. Hey Stephen Community, I came across your channel just before you started sharing stories. I wasn't sure about the topic, but that sure has changed after hearing everyone's shares. I just want to say 
Thank you to everyone for letting the truth be known. It's really changed the way I think about life, for good and bad, I suppose. I came across this interesting footprint that other, the other day while hiking with the dog. I don't know what to think about it. I guess I'm impartial. I figured some of our community might like to see the pictures. Some are probably like us and don't care much. Cody. All right, then I got a private one. All right, hold on a second. I got to read this private part to me first. Ugh. All right. Here are the photos. And um, to that private message, uh, share with me what you got, all right? If you want to get something out that's bothering you, you can share it here. It's okay to do it, man. Um, unfortunately, I don't know who you are. And I, I haven't ever promoted anyone's channel on here ever, okay? Now, uh, getting back to the, the, your photograph. Here's one. Yeah, hopefully that's working. Oh, I can see it. Classic. One photo. Here's another one with a uh, coin for reference. And there's another close-up, possibly the toes, right? Or what would probably be toes. All right, there you go. <clears throat> now, uh, I'm super glad that you're, you are asking questions yourself and you're becoming more aware of the hidden truths going on with all of our existence. That's a good thing. And uh, hopefully you can share that enthusiasm with a bunch of your friends too, all right, people you know? And get everybody going on that, on jumping on that train. We really need people to become aware of the honest truth of what's going on around us and share it, right? We don't need people who are in government. We don't need them to acknowledge shit. They're all a bunch of criminals, flat out criminals. So do I need anything from a criminal? I need nothing from a criminal. I need them locked up, if anything, but in the end, all we have is each other, right? So we need to share with each other the knowledge. I know there's still some, uh, possibly some good politicians out there. Currently, I don't know of any in my country. Now, <clears throat> moving along. Encounter in Alabama, one of my favorite states. A pile of super great, awesome people in the state of Alabama. Hello, Steve. First of all, I'd like to say that Canada is in my prayers with everything y'all are going through. Coincidence. Thank you. Absolutely appreciate that. My name is Mike, and the encounter I'd like to share took place on the outskirts of Mobile, Alabama, roughly in 84-85. I lived in Louisiana at the time, and my best friend had moved back to Alabama sometime before this occurred. I went to visit him during the summer months, and he told me of an abandoned house in the woods behind his subdivision. We went to this house in the woods one day, and all I can say is it was bizarre. The house is in decent shape considering its location, but what was bizarre was there were plates of food on the kitchen table with glasses of ice water. We checked throughout the house, but did not find anyone there. I know this sounds really crazy, but it is the truth. That's creepy. Anyway, we left the house and started walking back to a subdivision on a dirt road through the woods. To set the stage, on either side of the dirt road, there were trees that were obviously planted after the area had been logged. The lowest limbs on each tree was about nine feet from the ground, and every tree seemed to do the same, to be the same. So, we're walking, shooting the breeze with each other, and we start hearing something running towards us from behind, all the while hitting the tree limbs as it got closer and closer to us. He and I just looked at one another and started running as fast as two teenage boys could run with massive amounts of adrenaline slash fear pumping through our bodies. This literally scared the shit out of me. We never looked back and never stopped running until we arrived back at his house. That was the last time I visited my friend, but I will never forget the fear I felt because I knew whatever it was, it had to be gigantic to be hitting the tree limbs, which were eight to nine feet off the ground. At this point, I had no idea what this could be. I never really thought it could be one of these forest people, but as time has gone by, 
This is really all I think it could have been. Finally, I want to thank you for what you do, Stephen. May God bless you and your entire family, animals included. Take care. Mike. Mike, appreciate it, man. Like, you know what I'm going to say. I say to everybody, if you, uh, you had something happen to you and you couldn't stop, can't stop thinking about it all your life and you go and find this channel on your own and then find the email address and go out of your way to scratch off an, an email about it, you know what it was. You know what it was. And there is a ship pile of sightings in Alabama. All right, what's this one? <clears throat> East Texas Creek Footprints. Greetings, Steve. Thank you for everything you do. My friend, the truth will prevail. My last name is hard to pronounce, so you can call me Ryan Z. I'd like to share my story of finding footprints in an East Texas Creek bottom. This creek runs through my town and many others and is considered the longest continuous urban forested area in the country. It is basically a nature preserve sandwiched between two major urban developments loaded with marshy wetlands, thick forests, and amazing fishing, if you know where to look. Also, some alligators that you need to keep an eye on while fishing. This is my favorite place on earth, but the creek changes every year due to flooding. One day, best friend and I decided to hike back to our hunting hole fishing spot, about a half a mile off the main trail. Now, as we walk, on our left is a marshy wetland area, and on the right is the creek. We're making our way down the trail, my buddy points to the other side of the creek, where there is no trail, and pointed out very large footprints along the shoreline. That side of the creek is very hard to get to, and the forest is extremely thick and coated with kudzu, vine, and thorn bushes. Sure enough, there are these very large footprints in the mud on the shoreline. He told me he has seen them before along the stretch of creek a few weeks prior to this day. That got me curious. Luckily, I had my camera with me, and I took some photos of the prints from across the creek. They were very out of place and seemed to go into the water. The whole time we were fishing, I'd look over my shoulder as if something was watching us. A few weeks went by, and I went to the same area of the creek with my brother, and, and we saw the footprints again. Even he was stumped by them. We know all the wildlife that inhabits this area, and none of them make prints like that. They were either human, or they simply weren't. So, in a span of a few weeks that spring, my best friend had seen them multiple times, and I had seen them twice. It seems to be a recurring phenomenon on the same stretch of creek. The weirdest thing about them is where they are. Most people don't even bother going on that side of the creek because it is so dense and thick. From the distance we saw them at, they were still very large and seemed to be barefoot prints, as you can make out the heels. Any human walking barefoot down here is nuts. I did attach some photos I took of them. The thing that creeps me out about the footprints is like I said before, they're either human or they weren't human. I do appreciate you being a truth warrior, Steve. People all over the country and the world have your back. I send my best wishes from Texas and thank you for letting me tell my story. All right, man, thanks for sending that in. And uh, you can see the older age tracks along the creek bed too, right? Uh, we got And they're in straight line. Classic. Classic, classic inline prints. Laid down. All right, here you go, you guys. I'll hold it that way this time. So there's the first one. You can see those prints in the distance. And believe me. As, you know, initially you'd probably think, why don't you go across the creek and go check it out? Man, I've been in some creeks in Texas, South Texas, and there's just the snakes alone that were in the river. I mean, I swam in there after being uh, heckled by my Texan friends for being nervous. But the snakes down there, holy shit. And then if there's alligators in there, I wouldn't have swam across to take pictures. <laughs> there's a little closer. Oops. See them all straight in line. And there's zoomed up even more. All 
There you go. It's non-stop, isn't it? Southeast Texas. That's a seems to be a hot bed for sightings, right? Appreciate you sending that in, man. Absolutely appreciate you and, and your supportive words too. All right. What else do we got? Is it amazing how many freaking emails have come in here? Isn't it absolutely mind boggling? How many? Oh, here comes that diesel motor again. I don't know what that thing is over there. It sounds like it's old as dirt. Sabe's very incredible abilities. Please, anonymous. Gotcha. I'm hoping that you will have a blessed life and understand the enormous importance of what you do for us. I've come to accept and believe that they are very real from the screams and the smell of them. I've been stalked by this creature for years and noticed that it stayed downwind and avoids me when I had a larger caliber rifle. The shotgun muzzle, loader, and chainsaw are ignored by it, as are my pickaxe and axe. That tells me I'm dealing with an extremely intelligent, interesting being who is invisible to me. I've spent hours trying to see it to no avail. Observing deer, the deer in my food plots react to the being they could see, and I could not add it, and I could not add it to my belief in Sabe. Okay, there's no paragraphs in here. It's a little rough, but we'll get we'll get it read. I've heard and smelt it and felt its presence many times, but had not seen one until a month ago. When I saw one, it was about six feet tall and around 250 pounds. I started to roll my truck window down to see if my neighbor was looking for a lost animal, but as I got closer, it turned to me and I realized what I thought was a run-down headlamp was two red eyes, the color of a fire. I'm still trying to tell myself it's night vision goggles and the person is wearing a ghillie suit. Nervous now, I roll my window up and I'm not going to stop. I'm looking for a weapon and about 50 feet away from them and they vanished. They're in the open, about three feet from the road, just disappeared from in front of me. I was going really slow and they were in the wide open right away. I was freaked out, but I had been wondering but I had been wondering about the Sabe because they had not been around for a while, so I was reasonably sure that was one. The next morning at the same place, I didn't see anything else, but the second morning I saw an enormous six inch diameter, brighter than neon green light behind a tangled grapevine about two feet off the ground. The light was very still and I was thinking what it was and slowly approaching it. When I was about to pass it by, it turned its head and looked into my eyes. Imagine. Two six inch diameter eyes, easily over 12 inches apart. I was terrified. As I met my gaze, I felt his presence and intelligence, and the effect was very shocking to me. I typed, I typed in enormous glowing eyes to search YouTube and found your channel. No shit. Thanks so much for helping us, and especially me. What a relief to know I'm not insane and I'm not alone. Sorry so long an email, but I'm so glad you're doing what you do. I'm wishing to share this with you all, but I have to stay anonymous because I have a couple of small places and don't want them disturbed. I have many experiences to share and I hope they can help others. God bless you and your family and community and keep, all, and keep you all safe. All right, thanks for that. So it sounds like you've got a lot of experience with these things. I mean, these people, sorry. And, uh, the larger caliber gun. It's kind of funny, isn't it, that they even would even show fear of a weapon in a way because if it was a confrontation they were looking for, there's nothing we can do about it, really, right? But they do, they do, uh, they don't like firearms, so that tells us directly that a firearm can really F them up, right? I'll never forget that. Man, as I was standing there with the late, great John Benenegel in Vic at the University of Victoria back around over 20 years ago, and uh, this man came out and shared his, his experience, and this was in the Kootenays, which is a mountain range in southeastern BC, more on the southeastern side, and to make a long story short, um, 
he had his 30 odd six with a scope on it on the forehead of this thing. And I think he said it was only like 20 meters away from him. I said to him, I'm like, what? You had the scope on his face at 20 yards, meters? He said, yeah. I go, you saw everything. He goes, yeah. He said, I saw his eyes. He said he, he, he said he put the crosshairs from eyeball to eyeball up to the forehead. Yeah, he went from eyeball to eyeball and then up to the forehead and then just held the crosshairs straight on his face looking at it. And he said the look on his face was like, you know, it's an amazement looking back at him. And then he said all of a sudden the thing jumped behind the tree and then started peeking out like this. And then his buddy came up and then his buddy saw he was alarmed. So what are you doing? What's up? And he said, look at that. And his buddy, he said his buddy looked at it, saw it, and then he started really freaking out. And he said that his friend, when his friend put the gun up to look at this thing, it would really hide behind the tree, just showing its, its eyeball, just, just, just peeking out at it. And then his gun would go down and his gun would come up and then it would look right out at him. And then he said, his, when his buddy went to put his gun up, it would, it would duck out of the way and just, just peek out of the way. And he said, it was almost like they controlled it with each other's rifle. And that was when I was starting to, that was one of the first times I was really starting to figure out that there's a lot more to these beings than just a lost frickin' monkey, right? So I said to him, I said, what's your, what was your buddy's demeanor? What was he like? Is he a killer? You know, is he trigger happy or something? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, my friend was, would have been way, way more apt to, to pull the trigger on stuff for sure. I'm like, wow, no shit. So that thing knew the demeanor of that man, knew it. Crazy, eh? But there's the fact that that body language of the guns, it didn't want to get shot. It knew those guns were bad. It knew those guns were bad. Bad juju. <laughs> didn't want to get shot, right? Doesn't take a, a brain surgeon to pick up on that. Anyway, coffee's almost dead. Got to keep going on my... My short term, no short term. I got, I got, I've got some projects here. I'm almost at the end of them. I've got to get it done before I go. I got to start getting my hunting gear together. I'm going to make a video of it too and share it on the other channel for people who are curious what I'm going to bring. Because I am going to bring gear for. I call it comfortable camping. If I can use a quad or a motor vehicle of any time of any kind, it's like, oh my god, that's luxury. The stuff I can bring is luxury. Bigger sleeping bag, maybe even a chair. <laughs> you know. But when I go into the mountains solo, that's when it gets uncomfortable. And I'm not a guy, I'm not into, I'm not a trendy guy at all. Um, I'm not into uh, the in brand of anything. I just use what's practical, which what I can afford and it works. So my clothing is synthetic, layers, rubber ring gear. And uh, I, I, I'm probably kind of mean to myself when I go into the mountains backpack hunting because I just don't want to pack all extra shit. So I'll just have a mattress, a blow up mattress and a sleeping bag, small one, and uh, some shelter. Anyways, a babbling. I'm going to put all that in a video shortly for the other channel as I get my shit together to go. And I wonder if I've, how long I've been sitting here. I don't know. But I got to get going. You can see. See my brain scrambling. My brain starts scrambling out my mouth. <laughs> and I don't make any sense. All right, I'll try to shut up. <clears throat> uh, how long is this one? Whoa, that's a book. Definite book, can't do that one. Right now. Red, 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 red. All right, let's do this one more up in New Mexico. And then I'm gonna go get my shit together. <clears throat> Excuse me, weird sightings in New Mexico. Hi, Steve, you call me Remington. Yes, I like guns. I live in Northern New Mexico, and although I personally haven't had an encounter that I could say is a sad day, I've heard stories from a neighbor. I'm a Native American, and this neighbor is too. We live near the Hikariya Apache Nation. He told me over some beers that he had seen Sabe. His first encounter was in about 1980. He and his younger brother went out back from the farmhouse with BB guns and went exploring. 
They walked for a bit, came across what they thought was a black bear. Then they shot at it with their BB guns. This thing stood up and growled at them. They ran home. His next setting was at his other house one mile down the road from the old farmhouse years later. He went outside one night to pee up the porch and he was, while he was busy, he said he saw a shadow behind the outhouse. This outhouse is downhill and on some railroad ties. The top of the outhouse is at chest level, at the top of the ramp he was on. He then said he went inside to grab a gun and came back and the shadow was gone. My mother has seen weird stuff too. In 1990, something. In 1990 something. She was a cop. I was doing patrol down a road that went through a canyon. She had another cop behind her. They drove past an old native grandma walking down the road towards her, but on the opposite side of the road. She went down the road and turned around because she didn't want any she didn't want the old lady to get hit by a car. She went back to where the old lady was, and she was gone. Her and the other cop then shone the spotlights from their cars down the embankment embankment and up the canyon wall. Steve, my mom said this old lady was crawling up this rock wall. To get to the rock wall, she would have had to go off the road and down a ravine and back up. And where she was crawling was vertical or at a reverse angle. My mom and the other cop hauled ass out of there and went to the station. My weirdest story is seeing a large coyote or a wolf. We don't have wolves in, in northern Ness, N-E something. In the summer of 2020 or 21 June, I was joy riding down a forest one lane road that had a pipeline running beside it. As I was going down the road where the trees close in, I saw at first what I thought was a deer jumping across the road. It cleared the road and stopped, but it wasn't a deer. It was a canine of some sort. It was three feet tall and four or five feet long. It crossed right to left in front of me and ran to the left. It crossed a creek and kept running. While it was running, I brought my 30-30 Winchester out of the window and was saying, slow down, damn it. It got to about 80 to 100 yards away and still looked big. I had it in my sights, but my hammer fell in an empty chamber. When the rifle went click, the canine ran to the trees on the other side of the clearing. I sat in awe for a minute until a forest ranger came down the road towards me. I asked her if we had wolves, and she said she didn't think so. I told her about the large canine I just saw, and she said if I shot it, she didn't know what would happen. I proceeded to finish my joyride, but not before getting stuck. It was a two-wheel drive forward. I walked out of ways and found a hunter who was also stuck. He had high centered his truck and a berm of dirt access, a, a, ber, a berm of dirt across the road. I helped him get out and he helped me get out. Thank you for telling these experiences and sharing the info. God bless and be safe and love on your horses for me. All right, man. That one you said about the old, the old lady, quote, old lady, end quote, uh, crawling up the steep rock face wall. Uh, there's a military guy who claimed to have watched a man in Afghanistan do the exact same thing. Walked up a wall. What the F, right? What the F. The crazy shit that's going on around this planet, I'll tell you what. The puzzle pieces. How's everybody's puzzle doing anyway? Anybody out there got their, is anybody's puzzle getting filled in? It's kind of almost impossible, isn't it? Because once you start filling in the puzzle on the topic of the Sasquatch or Sabe people, it you cannot help but have your puzzle grow in size. And then all of a sudden you see a shit pile of pieces missing over here that are directly related to that puzzle, right? It's almost like it's it's almost like it's impossible to fill in all the puzzle pieces. But anyway, man, my brain gets taxed enough as it is for me to start wondering about everything else right now. I gotta go. I can't wait to get back in the mountains and start videotaping from there. I can't even get down to the river. I dropped off my quad at the dealership to to get them to go over one end of it to the other end of it because where I'm going, I'm going to be a long ways away from anywhere solo and I need that, I need to know that that thing's not going to uh, crap out on me. I've had it happen before and it sucks. 
So, I can't even go down to the river. Um, who knows, I might go up the other river later on and see if I can't get some cool underwater video of the Chinook salmon that are in there right now. And maybe get a share done from there possibly and show you guys some of that shit going on. It's pretty cool. And then, uh, anyways, I'm babbling. I'm babbling ding dong right now. I gotta get going. Gotta get moving. And uh, share my story at howtohunt.com. You got something that you need to get up your chest or something to share to help the people, get it to us, all right? Back shortly.